We're in Africa on anti-poaching patrol and we're surprising the locals with thermal. Management gives you population, it gives you future. We're in Yorkshire looking for rabbits with long dogs. If I tell people tonight I'm landing rabbits in their head straight away, they see me as a poacher. And we're in Cornwall where the government wants to ban tuna fishing. So this needs to continue, it really does. And I'm going to give any, all the support and all the lobbying that I can. We're giving away a shoot party box from the Elliott Ross Hamper Company priced at £699. You'll have a happy Christmas with that. Meredith is on the news stump. David is in Saudi Arabia, don't ask why. And James Marchington is back with Hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. Paul, Sergio and David's incredible trip to Mozambique is drawing to an end. But there is still plenty to get their teeth into. Lions, if they come, you keep calm. They will go. <laughs> they will go. Yeah. Sergio, who invited us on this safari and has made the whole thing run so smoothly, has yet to pull the trigger. We want to try and retrieve some of the Sacco blade rounds from our buffalo. Manuel wants Paul to shoot a problem hyena and Shocked by the scale of snaring we highlighted last time, we all want to know if anything can be done to stop the destruction of wildlife and habitat. Maybe some new tech? Management gives you population, it gives you future. Let's start with the boys on the front line, the trackers. Many of them are ex-poachers, of course. This is Manuel's newest recruit. Hello. Hello. Moi <laughs> Rui <laughs> is born in 1923. Wow. And he's my oldest tracker. He's the one that knows all this area. So he's 99 years of age? 99. And he went home some years ago and uh, some weeks ago he, he asked permission to come back to work. So there he is. So retirement was getting a bit dull, was it? Yes. And you just got some new boots, you've got a new, whole new outfit. Oh, you yeah. have a new uniform and new boots. How are the boots? Boots good? As bottas are good. As bottas are good. Yeah, good. Good. They are good. <laughs> <laughs> Staying with trackers, and we are about to get a lesson in snaring. And that, that height is important, is it? Altura in the right? See, altura. Buffalo, he has it sort of like at groin height. Eland, he has it at the bottom of the snare at belly button height. You're targeting your, your species. It's similar the same as the UK when I said, you know, we have these holding devices and we set them at certain heights so we don't catch certain things. I'll take one for the team, shall I? I'll put my safety glasses on. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah all right. <laughs> yeah, it's not a laughing matter, but I couldn't resist, David. That worked a treat, didn't it? You know, yeah. right up in, obviously underneath an arm or something like that, or where the buffalo had it around his neck. And of course, once you start resisting, you start bending. So, you know, Peter was just telling me, you know what that cable is from? No. This cable is from when they were doing from Lishinga. To the other towns, electricity. They would electricity, oh yeah. Knock them down. Yeah. To use the cables for snares. So, I wear the priorities, eh? Yeah. As a matter, they can live with, in the dark with fire and 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 candles, but uh, and even when there's free meat available here. Yeah. Well, now it is by projects like Manuel's doing. Boy, yeah. Ah, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. What Peter is saying is because. The, the effort of they find that, they'll take it away, find that, take it away. So they start using something else and they set up another, another snare for us to see on a, on a, with the material that they are, do, they are using now because they no longer have access to the electric. cable like that. Yeah, yeah. So they set up another one up the road, so we're going to see it now. The other cable, if the animal struggles like we saw in the buffalo, the cable gets hot and snaps. Yeah. That one doesn't. It is, 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 is proper steel cable. Yeah. 
Like the tow cable. Yeah, yeah. So just winch dig, cable. Zing, dig, zing, dig, yeah. Zing. The other one we saw when he saw the buffalo, it snapped. Yeah, Probably because it struggles so much. Spinning around, yeah. And gets hot and snaps. So now they are using around it. This type of cable. Back in camp, the guys are unloading and breaking down our buffalo. That's the damage of the bullet in the heart. Oh my god. Oh. So the only means of getting that animal back was uh, to slice and dice it up a bit then. It was in a very, very difficult place. We had to cut it in pieces and bring it ju just where we could arrive with the vehicle. It's taken 12 hours to retrieve it. 12 hours. From camp there and back, 12 hours. But there he is. Have done his job. Yeah. They will dry most of the carcass for eating in camp or by the local community. However, some cuts are to bait the local carnivores, especially a hyena that's getting too confident around camp. We drag them to let uh, smell. Yeah. The hyenas will follow the smell to the, to the bait. How far? From here, uh, three kilometers. Really? <coughs> I thought you were going to say 300 meters. <laughs> So it's a bit of a skill to do this then, Manuel. You obviously hang it off the ground. Is that what's make them take longer to... Yeah. We're going to leave it in a way that they touch it and don't eat it all. Right. So longer to get through it. And, yeah. Tomorrow morning we come and have a look. Yeah. If they add a lot, we bring with us... Uh, a bit more. From the buffalo. Yeah, yeah. And we put flour. Okay. Then tomorrow is easier for them to eat. So. Yeah, yeah. Something like that. Um, si that. Single calls, not the. What's not that then? That's a hyena. Like a kookaburra. No, no, that's a. Woo! Something, something similar to that. So hopefully you see it and hear it and you say, oh, Paul, that was amazing. <laughs> You're probably, they're probably coming in right now. <laughs> the words from Mum are, ah, um, hyena comes in, get a good clean shot, make sure you place it high in the shoulder. If it runs off, do not track it. We will, we will come to you and then we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so again, when someone that's done it for a long time tells you that, you know that if that animal's wounded, yeah, you don't want to get in hold of your cameraman. On the way back to camp, Manuel suggests Sergio takes a warthog for meat. He just needs to check zero on the new Sacco 100, which Paul has named Sarah since our buffalo hunt. Sarah Connor. If you know, you know. That's it. Ah, I was a bit apprehensive. I was a bit apprehensive for the kick. It's a little bit bigger than my 243. <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a great good shooting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like yeah. solid. Yeah. Okay. No, it's not like Paul. Oh! oh. <laughs> 25 shot later. <laughs> 25 yeah. shot. With Sarah on song, we set off towards a waterhole where there's usually a lot of warthog traffic. It's not Sergio's most challenging hunt. It's more like shopping. He dropped. Yeah, he dropped. He's dead. And the trackers celebrate his achievement when he returns to the truck. No hint of sarcasm from the team or hint that Paul had a part to play in their enthusiastic reaction. It's an amazing looking animal and the Sacco Blade in 375 dropped it on the spot. The warthog, when he looked, all he could see was the massive thief, teeth. So, so, yeah. You went for a chest shot, obviously, straight on. It yeah. Was the right one, was he? No, the, 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 I don't know their behavior that much, but the hair was up. Manuel said, front shot. So, and he dropped. Okay. So, it was... And a little bit about, the, about, about him then, is he, was, how old did Manuel say he was? It's, um, how old he will be, Manuel? Eight years old. Yeah, he's long, and he's sharp teeth, so he'd been, he'd been around for some time. So, we're not allowed to call it bacon, but it's going to be a nice meat anyway. Overboil it, it'll fall apart, I suppose. Yes. Back yeah. in camp, Omar the Skinner has been busy. So, Omar, how long has this buffalo been in here? Uh, 
Yeah, for the four or five hours. Four or five hours? Yes. And then pick all the bits, piece off? Then I will take it out. Yeah. I leave it cold a little bit. Then I'll start clean, take out all, all of the meat. Yeah, meat, yeah. Yeah. You built this, yes? Yeah, it's me, yeah. It's me who built this. Yeah. 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 To cut like that is me who cut like that. Yeah. Omar also retrieves the 375 Sacco blade from the Warthog. Went from the, the front, traveled the lungs, the top of the heart, and went through the stomach and ended up in the, in the back end, in the, in the gut of the back end. It was a frontal shot, so... It ended right at the back end? Ended right in the back end, yeah. Stopped in the gut. With so much happening around the camp beyond the hunting, David asks Manuel for a few minutes to talk about his stewardship of this piece of Mozambique. Human population growth is his greatest fear, with that population believing their natural resources will continue to deliver, despite greater pressure. They don't think that the same forest that gave to their ancestors the, the food and the um, the wood and the bamboos for building and the same forest have limits. They are using too much that forest and we, the supposed civilized people, uh, we have to teach them different ways of living using the land but properly using the forest sustainably, I don't know if is that the word, yes. and uh, not destroying like, like they are doing today, is total destruction. And people like me living here make a, an enormous effort for that to not happen. If the others that are against me, against us, put their efforts together with mine, perhaps we can save all this forest and all this wildlife. I don't want them to come and take snares from the bush. I need all these people to come here and educate this population. Tell them that there's no future for their, their children. If you help us, we help you. We cannot keep fighting. I found, I found the With a hyena to hunt, it's all change again, and this time Paul is going to zero the Hick Micro Alpex scope. This is the new Alpex night vision. So we've got to get it zeroed in this afternoon, a couple of shots. We did this at home, so it shouldn't be too far away. That shouldn't be a problem at all. It's it's actually a great scope because it's for me it's I've got exactly the same, which is a Stella in thermal. So there's not a lot to learn on it for me. Last night we'd been out with the Falcon Thermal Spotter and got some great shots of Hartebeest. We took this out last night just to just to try it um, on some of the Plains game and <laughs> I actually really love it. I've been using the Griffin before and I like the Griffin but this is clear. So we just come back to camp from zero in the, uh, the night vision scope here. Literally going back to camp and been dragging, dragging the bait all the way to get that scent sent to the, to the bait station and one of the trackers come back and said, oh, he was on the bait. Actually, the one that we're after was already on the bait. So um, we said, ran off, there's loads of monkeys there as well. They all kicked off. I think there's a big load of fresh bait there. I think when everyone goes in, I think within the next hour, she just tickle back. That's what I hope anyway. That'll save a long, hard night. So um, we're going to sit up there for an hour and a couple of hours and then have dinner and then go back out again. But I think it's a good, good chance for it. So, I mean, not too bad. All good. As it's our last night in camp, all we can do is give it a go. Frustratingly, we see nothing, which could be down to change in wind direction. The following morning, Paul has a last look at our buffalo. 
British politicians are trying to ban these bits of bone and horn being brought back into the UK. A little bit. Sorry to that. I'm glad it didn't get as close as that. Yes. Imagine that coming close to you and... We had some horror stories last night, didn't we? Yeah, I mean, that's the weight of that is one thing with those, with the horns, but 750 kilograms behind it, or 800 kilograms behind it, pushing through, I mean, that's just immense. I have to put it down because it's so heavy. Um, yeah, Omar's done a great job of boiling that out with his custom build boiler. Look at that, eh? Fantastic. And then Serge's warthog. That are beautiful. Yeah, that would make a lovely knife, wouldn't it? Yeah. Fantastic keepsakes of a of a very memorable trip. Well, you just said keepsakes, and that's exactly what they are. That is that is basically fly fodder. However, it means something. <laughs> By not allowing this stuff to come back, wouldn't have stopped me from from coming across here. It's a crying shame to, to go to waste, really. Now, we blanked last night. Yes, we we pushed it as long long as we could. Uh, um, it was really funny because the wind changed. The wind was, we could smell the bait, and then it changed about 11, half 11, 12. And there was buffalo come to a water hole at the back we could hear. There was animals calling around, some birds calling around us. And then it just went, Pew! And we thought, that's a bit weird, very strange. But then, of course, we suddenly realised we could smell the, the smoked meat, actually. That's what I smelled, smoked meat. Um, coming straight to the camps, obviously, it's pushing the wind straight to the bait area. And, so, yeah, so we, we called it a day. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a great experience. I think I preferred staying in that camp rather than the one at the back because the one at the back would, would have been a bit remote for me. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was, um, we had a few snoozes, didn't we, during the yeah, night yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. There was a bit but it was good. It was good to, good to see the kit in, in, uh, in action. And actually, this is what we're going to be giving to um, Manuel. We're going to give him a, a Lynx Thermal. Basically, a nice tool for the job and nice that Hick have um, you know, put it up there. It's like a giveaway for them. Well, Manuel, here we go. We've got a, a gift from Hick Micro. It's a, it's a thermal spotter and it's just a gift from them just to hopefully help you and your, and your trackers with your bit of poacher patrol and your, and your follow ups. I hope it'll come in. Thank you very much, too. Coming well. That will help a lot. Thank you very much. What will you, what will you use it for? We can use it at night with wounded animals and we can see where they are yeah. easily yeah. and also for the poaching. Perfect. Well, good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Left eye dominant. Yeah. Pleasure. No, pleasure. <laughs> good. Thank you. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you. Hopefully it keeps somebody safe anyway. <laughs> we leave the last word to Sergio. Having seen the operation here, he knows who would embrace the opportunity. If you have that mentality that you, you want to feel Africa and what Africa is about, yeah, we can help you that. And that is the, the sort of clients, the sort of people we need. People that want to hunt, but also want to help and be proud of what they've done. Because there's no point to to, for us to do all this and then be anonymous about it. You know, you need to be proud of what you just done because you've done a lot more good than you did wrong by shooting an animal. We need to shoot an animal to save a species. And that's what you have to do. And that's what I want to do. The night after they left, this is what appeared at the bait station in <laughs> camp. It, it doesn't matter. This it trip is. to Mozambique has given Paul, Sergio and David experiences and adventures they'll dine out on for years. <laughs> if you would like to experience Mozambique for yourself, drop Sergio a line. If you want to find out more about the SACO 100 or Powerhead Blade Copper Ammunition, go to sacco.fi. And if you want to discover more about the Hick Micro range, go to hickmicrotech.com. Thank you, Paul, Sergio, Manuel, and all who took part in that. Now, the winner of this week's prize draw gets a shoot party box from the Elliot Ross Hamper Company. Seen here being enjoyed by Top Shot Peter Wilson and friends in Dorset. It consists of four bottles of champagne, two bottles of slow gin, and ten crystal champagne flutes, all in an armoured box that can take a battering on the back of a quad for a shoot day. It is the most expensive item made by the Elliot Ross Hamper Company, which has generously put it up as a prize on Field Sports Extra. And there's a link to buy it below if you want to know how to win it, how to enter the competition, watch the Field Sports Nation's own TV show, Field Sports Extra, which is out on Tuesdays. And you can do that by joining the Field Sports Nation for a fiver a month or by joining up one of your Field Sports buddies, the Christmas gift for the sportsman or woman 
who has everything. Link to that below. Now from top class shoot day entertainment to Meredith this week on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. You are watching Field Sports Channel News. A Scottish falconer is fighting the Scottish Government to amend legislation to allow falconers to fly their birds on mountain hares. Since last March, the Scottish Government banned birds from killing, injuring or taking mountain hares without a licence. The new rules mean that this footage of one of Roy Lupton's golden eagles taking a hare is now illegal. Falconer Barry Blyther says the legislation is fatally flawed and not fit for purpose. Falconers and gamekeepers fear that without hunting or shooting sports, nobody will conserve mountain hares and their numbers will go the same way that the brown hare population did in the wake of Tony Blair's ban on coursing. In a campaign backed by our own Roy Lupton, Barry submitted a petition to the Parliament at Holyrood to amend the law to accept falconry. Thanks to Richard Walton for the story. If the eagle sees a hare, it is going to follow its natural instincts and put in that devastating near vertical stoop back to ground in a bid to catch the hare. On around 15% of occasions it will be successful, but as evolution has shaped the predator and the prey, in most situations, on most occasions, the eagle, uh, sorry, the hare, quite frankly, makes the eagle look quite foolish, outmanoeuvres it and trots off up the hills largely unconcerned. Conservation charity Lion Landscape has published its contribution to the call for evidence for the Animals Abroad Bill. Written by the charity's joint CEOs, Professor Amy Dickman and Elaine Cotterell, the charity says, despite all the media attention, IUCN Red List data shows that current trophy hunting is not a major threat to any species at a range-wide scale. To effectively support conservation, it would be far more impactful to take action that addresses major threats to wildlife. A huntsman has admitted illegal hunting. The man was hunting with Leicestershire's corn hunt in January. A court heard that Leicestershire police seized his phone and found communication with an unnamed huntsman on WhatsApp about illegal fox hunting. Magistrates say the huntsman showed a pattern of offending over a period of time and fined him £656. A spokesperson for the British Hound Sports Association says this organisation does not condone illegal activity and the matter has been referred to the Hound Sports Regulatory Authority. A Facebook deerstalking group is holding a series of events across the UK. The Ladies Deer Stalking UK Facebook group held their latest open day at Rifleman Firearms Range in Somerset. The 600 strong group is holding events at ranges all over the UK and organising deer stalking outings for women. I think Facebook gave us the, the best reach um, and it's what a lot of people are using now. Um, we do meet up with people um, at shows like the Game Fair, we're going to be at the stalking show in April with the stand. Police confiscated a vehicle believed to belong to Antis after police found it was being driven without insurance. Hertfordshire Constabulary towed the Green Land Rover Defender from outside the Puckridge Hunt Kennels. The hunt called police after residents spotted the vehicle cruising around the area. A police spokesman says no offences were identified and no arrests made. A church has cancelled its carol service after a campaign of hate by Sabs. The Diocese of Hereford announced that based on police advice they are cancelling a service for the local hunt, the United Pack, in the interest of the personal safety of a clergy member and those attending. The decision came after Sabs posted details of the carol service at St George's Church in Shropshire alongside the email address of Reverend Caroline Harrison. Antis asked their supporters to get in touch and complain. A gamekeeper took action when he saw two foxes near his pheasant pen at his home in Somerset. Andy Francis shot one of the predators near his home in North Somerset and was surprised to find it was wearing a reflective dog collar. Andy, who has been a gamekeeper all his life, says he hasn't seen anything like it before. Yeah, it was a new one to me. I've uh, been keeping for 20-something years now and uh, that's the first time I've ever had... Um ever had one with a collar on it. Wildlife wardens in the US have busted a poaching ring. California Fish and Wildlife Wardens arrested six people and are searching for a seventh. 
Called the E-Bike Crew, the gang is believed to be responsible for dozens of illegal kills of local wildlife. They have been charged with 21 offences, including allegations of forgery, conspiracy, receiving of stolen property, animal cruelty and possession of an untagged bear. South Africa's Tourism Department celebrated World Wildlife Conservation Day with a tweet that included animals not from South Africa. The image included local animals, including African elephants, rhino and giraffe species. It also featured a Javan Rusa deer, a tapir and a tiger. A spokesman said that the day focuses on fauna and flora across the globe, but later deleted the tweet. And finally, Scottish gamekeepers are offering free hot meals and game meat to local families. Estates in Aberdeenshire and Councillor Jeeva Blackett have joined forces to deliver ready-cooked meals, including pheasant and venison casseroles. They are working with the Grampian Moorland Group's Game for Giving project, delivering venison, mints, sausages and even logs. Scotland's regional Moorland Groups hope to offer meals to at least 1,000 people. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News, stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Buying shooting kits? Then head to Kit Finder and our team will help you find the right product at a fair price from dealers all over the UK. Kit Finder, the shooting kit comparison website. Thanks, Meredith. Next, I met up with Field Sports Nation member Andy Hayes, who is on a mission to show that running long dogs on rabbits is fun, rewarding and legal. That's what's supposed to happen. Andy spots the rabbit. He slips the lurcher. That incredible gaze hound, the product of centuries of breeding, picks up the quarry in the lamplight and it piles in and catches it. So we're on a, on a sheep moor. We're going to try and catch a few rabbits tonight. There's a lot of rabbits going to be in here. Obviously they're eating grass, the sheep to come on here. Um, so we need to try and get rid of them if we can. There's something that looks like a castle behind you. That's, that's part of the dam. It's, we're on a reservoir here. It's part of the dam wall, is that? That looks very Victorian. <laughs> yeah, it's a, nice, it's a nice area. Uh, it's obviously, you can't see it because it's dark, but yeah, it's where we are is a nice part of the world. This is High Nidderdale in Yorkshire, sheep country. And he reckons eight rabbits can have the graze of one sheep on this ground. To catch them, he breeds and trains his lurchers carefully. Oh, get up. Andy belongs to a group of eight lurchermen called the North Yorkshire Kelpie Crew. Training is key. Andy wants dogs that go out, fetch rabbits and bring them back on command. They're Kelpie grounds. A Kelpie is a little bit like a Collie, but they're Australian. Australian sort of cattle dogs, if you like. R rabbits really are the, I, I reckon, ultimate quarry for, for a lurcher. The, no two rabbits run the same. The, the jink, the, you know, the the clever, obviously they know this land better than dog does. The good, it's good fun, it's good sport, um, good, it's enjoyable to watch. And you end up with delicious rabbit at the end of it? Yeah, yeah, there's a uh, rabbit for freezer to feed me ferrets or I have I have people that breed breed dogs that, that buy it for pet food or butchers that buy it to sell and yeah, we have a good outlet for them. It's not just rabbits and sheep up here. We come across all kinds of unusual wildlife, like this partridge. When we find rabbits in the lamp, the dogs are successful about a quarter of the time. Now you may think that this is just man and dog in action, but there is a little bit of kit to get used to. Yeah, so the beauty of these carriers that Ian Clayton makes, obviously if you've just seen there, dogs caught a rabbit, it's instantly dispatched, head in there, job done. No messing about with little stringy carriers around the feet and, you know, just in there, easy. Andy is not averse to using more techie kit too. 
in this long grass, obviously they get squat and they're hard to see. Um, obviously they can't, nothing can hide from thermal. Uh, it's a Hick, Hick Micro Owl 35. I've been out with, with a few friends foxing with their Pulsar, um, uh, Helions and Axions etc. You know, they're, they're good but I think for under two grand I think these Hick are probably one at best for, you know, in that price range. Andy agrees that lurcher work has an image problem. Once upon a time, there was a sense of the honourable poacher taking one for the pot. Those days are long past, and with them, the positive image of the lurcher as a good way to feed the family. Now they're, they're wanting to drive land, they're wanting to um, you know, run, run anything they can, and when they've killed it, it's, it's phony it edge and forgot about. If I tell people tonight I'm lamping rabbits in their head straight away, they see me as a poacher. To them, lamping is poaching. You see your Simon Whiteheads of the world ferreting and nobody blinks an eye. You know, you have such as like Simon, Phil Lloyd, them types of guys who are writing books about ferreting and, um, you know, Jeff Jefferson, he, he's, he's out promoting ferreting all the time. So when, when people see people ferreting, they gen don't generally think they're up to no good. Andy wants to change perceptions of lurcher work by using the media. He has written for shooting magazines about it and he wants to see more films on YouTube presenting the positive, legal side of the sport. He's careful to get permission wherever he works his dogs. He loves working his dogs and his main aim is rabbits. Probably end on 15, some like that, I think, but by the time we get back to the car, which, uh, we, my sort of standards ain't great, really. Um, probably, he, he, he's capable of 30 on his own. Well, I'm happy. By the end of the evening, the dogs have had plenty of runs and we have rabbits to take home. You can find Andy on Instagram. Thanks, Andy. Next up, a word from ATN about its thermal monocular. Now, one of the big successes in UK field sports in recent years has been the growth of bluefin tuna fishing. News correspondent Deborah Hadfield reports on how the government plans to put a stop to it. Landing a giant bluefin tuna is a challenge, not least because anglers around the UK have only been allowed to do it for the last two years. The chart programme, funded by the Westminster government, licenses some tuna sport fishing boats in Devon, Cornwall, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland. Now tuna anglers are facing a much tougher challenge to persuade politicians to secure its future. DEFRA officials have told the UK Bluefin Tuna Association that the catch and release chart programme is out of scope for 2023, as DEFRA speak for won't happen. In anticipation of uh, you know, a licensed fishery, if not next year, then in future years, and we were expecting at least a very limited pilot programme, which would probably involve the same skippers who are all geared up and have clients coming to Cornwall to fish with them. They've started taking bookings for next year, and to be told that, oh, well, we're not doing it, we're not having a licensed fishery, and oh, you, there might be a, a sort of small survey programme, is very, very disappointing. So if we don't have a chart programme next year, or a legal recreational fishery, what we're going to end up with is an illegal recreational fishery. And as we've already seen this year and last year, we do have people out there fishing for bluefin without a licence. And without effective policing and enforcement, the, the likelihood is that the number of anglers wanting to target bluefin illegally will increase. Now who can blame them? These are magnificent fish. We've got a world-class fishery here. The association says that its conversations with DEFRA over the last five months focused on the possibility of replacing the chart programme with a recreational fishery. The Angling Trust and now the UK Bluefin Tuna Association, as we are, have been working on this with the government and with DEFRA for four years and they've been dangling this uh, recreational fishery 
uh, in front of us, a licensed recreational fishery in front of us for two years, ever since we got the quota from I, I cat. It's true that some DEFRA officials are very keen for this to happen and there are some legislative obstacles to get over in order to make sure that you know we can run a licensing system. Political pundit Nigel Farage is a bluefin enthusiast. These are big fish, it's dangerous. You know, mad overboard is a very real possibility when you've got one of these fish on. You've got to know what you're doing, you've got to have the right equipment. But I mean, for chart, those 25 boats that are doing this in England already, they have spent big five-figure money, all of them, on the right rods, the right reels, the right harnesses, the right chairs, everything to make it safe and correct for the angler. They've more than done their bit. Not to renew chart would be an absolute betrayal um, of those men that have done this. So this needs to continue. It really does. And I'm going to give any all the support and all the lobbying that I can. The association says that while they're planning to end sport fishing, DEFRA officials are trying to progress their plans for a commercial bluefin tuna fishery. We have no objection to a commercial fishery in, in principle, but only a limited one. And, you know, we know that the Cornish fishing fleets are not prepared uh, for catching tuna. I have got no problem, honestly, with those local boats, those genuine, wet, not Japanese longliners, but those, the, the, those local, if those local West Country fishermen were allowed a couple of fish a month for four or five months a year, it would make zero difference to the amount of stock, um, but would make commercial fishing a lot more realistic for many who are struggling. So look, I have no problem with a sensible level of commercial landings, but it does appear in DEFRA's mind, they're prioritizing with their application, they're prioritizing the commercials and ignoring the huge economic benefits to those communities of recreational sea angling. The Angling Trust has a meeting scheduled for this week with the new fisheries minister, Mark Spencer, and will be fighting for a U-turn. We have said to him directly by letter, and we will in the meeting on, on Thursday the 15th, we will say this fishery is open, it's already functioning, but it's not legal. And really, do you want uh, an illegal fishery operating in, the U in UK waters that you cannot m uh, manage, there's no enforcement uh, available I in Cornwall or Devon, there's no resources available for enforcement. And the interest to book boats to go out and catch tuna is increasing. The worst charter skippers that have been involved so far are already being asked for trips next year. So what are we to do? Are we to say no to these bookings because we don't know what's in place? Or do we accept the bookings knowing that there's a possibility that we may not be able to take them next year? Of course, these anglers who do book us to go blue for tuna next, fishing next year will book accommodation, book time off work and incur lots of expense. So it's really vital that there is some way that we can target these bluefin next year, whether that be through a chart programme or a licensed recreational fishery. Anglers are determined to fight what they describe as a discriminatory decision. We've done a lot of work uh, and you know we've invested our time and um, money in trying to make this recreational fish fishery happen and it's very very disappointing when every single turn we seem to be uh, you know come up against obstacles whether it's DEFRA or, or the behavior of the scientific arm CFAS or, or all sorts of other things not least the weather as well of course which causes havoc at certain times um, and so we really are working very hard to try and make sure that we do get a recreational fishery. As with many aspects of government, the loss of chart may be a funding issue. Tim says that DEFRA has asked them to look into funding sources to create what he calls chart light. If they're going to do a chart programme next year, they're going to have to find alternative sources of funding. DEFRA officials and CFAS are talking about a, something called chart light, which is a pretty meaningless phrase. But what it does mean is if a chart programme is ahead, it means instead of 25 boats, probably five, maybe even three. So an awful lot of people who've spent a lot of money investing in gear, have got a lot of clients waiting to go tuna fishing next year, won't be able to do it. In the two years of English chart programmes, skippers, crews and anglers have tagged more than 1,800 fish. 
The bluefin tuna tagging programme only happened after many years of anglers battling DEFRA officials. They're determined not to lose this opportunity to follow their passion of landing the most magnificent big game fish in the UK. So this is terrific sport fishing. And I had a day last year with my brother and nephew, Adam Evergizzi. We had nine to the boat, nine to the boat, nine bluefin up to 400 pounds in one day. I've spent tens of thousands of pounds going all over the world since the late 1980s. I've never had a better day's sport fishing in my life. Right from the, the first take, when that reel screams, the adrenaline starts pumping. Hot starts going a bit faster. And then when that rod is taken from the gunnel, put into your harness and you're strapped to it, and you feel the full power of that fish, it really is the most amazing experience. And no other fish have I ever caught in the UK or around the world that can come close to the power of a bluefin tuna. Thanks to all who took part in that. And Deborah's article on this, which goes alongside the film, is on our website. Next, from fish to hunting YouTube, brought to you by James Marchington. This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. If you've been feeling the cold this week, spare a thought for Clay Hayes in the USA. He's camping out in the mountains in 10 degrees below freezing and hunting elk with a flintlock rifle. Back to the UK and rather milder conditions from early October. Owen Beardsmore is after Seeker in the Highlands in this beautifully shot film on his Service UK channel. Moving south, Dan Thor is shooting high pheasants at the Upperwood Estate in Lancashire in this video from Jack Pike. Following a driven day from the other side, here's a very enthusiastic Rico the Working Cocker Spaniel, loving every minute of a day in the beating line in North Yorkshire. Talking of enthusiasm, here's Johnny Carter of TGS Outdoors, launching a new series of gun reviews with his mates Ryan and Michael. Will it become the top gear of the gun trade? Time will tell. Confused about non-lead shot? Hull cartridge cut to the chase, taking a team of experienced shots to shoot driven partridges with their latest bismuth and steel game loads. After all that driven shooting, here's some more down-to-earth sport, rabbiting in mud and floods with the South Somerset ferreters. And finally, the National Gamekeepers Organization reckon it's time the law put a stop to the abuse and intimidation that their members endure daily. That's it for this week. We've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the i symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you'd like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email Charlie the link, charlie at fieldsportschannel.tv. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv. You can click to like us there on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, pop your email address into our register page, and we'll contact you about this show, Field Sports Britain, which is out 7 p.m. UK time every Wednesday. And this has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>